finally, Justin says, in Australia, most business email signatures now have an acknowledgement to the first people, nations. Most public events, clubs, meetings, arts, openings, and any other gathering are kicked off with a land acknowledgement. Um, thanks, Justin. I, I didn't know this, I guess. I, I mean, I, I guess at some, uh, some recess of my mind, I knew that stuff like this was happening. But uh, it turns out that in the U.S. now, many companies start with this called land acknowledgement. So um, it's, it, this is now, um, you know, a practice where you are preceding any fancy event uh, or any business event. You, uh, you name the indigenous people that were slaughtered or whose land was taken on which the event is being held. And you kind of give them an acknowledgement. You, you, nothing more than that. You don't, you don't, you know, uh, give, give them any money. You don't, you don't promise to give the better land back. You don't do anything substantive, but you make an acknowledgement. You give it a sanction. And uh, so this came to my attention because of a story that Barry Weiss, uh, Barry Weiss uh, wrote about a professor, Professor Stewart, Regis, Regis, at the University of Washington. He's a computer science professor. I mean, this guy is like, he likes to, he likes to, you know, uh, rub it in. He likes to be controversial. He likes to get out there. Uh, this is a guy that in the in 1980s, uh, with a very early in his career, uh, made a big deal out of the fact that he was gay and, and it was openly gay. Uh, at a time when that was not very popular uh, and, and that could really get you in, in trouble. Uh, in the 1990s, when he was, a, when he was at Stanford, uh, he, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was out there protesting against the war on drugs. Um, he, uh, he's written a piece about why women can't code. That'll get you in trouble. And he, he, he reads, uh, he, he's got a poem on his website tit titled Fag Talk. So not a, not a traditional anything, <laughs> not a traditional left, not a traditional right, not a traditional anything really, kind of eclectic, but certainly non-conformist. Non anyway, um, at the beginning of the fall 2020 semester, fall 2020 is when the world seemed to just give in to the left. Anything the left wanted, yes, sir, we give it to you. This is... The consequence, though, the, 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 the fact that Black Lives Matter won the moral high ground uh, back then, um, everybody just collapsed in front of them. So not only on the Black Lives Matter specific issue did they collapse, but they collapsed on pretty much every issue, uh, every issue out there, and, and this is one of them. Uh, so the University of Washington in the fall of 2020 suggested, suggested uh, as best practices that uh, professors, when on, on uh, documents like syllabi, uh, when they publish their syllabi, they, um, they uh, include an indigenous land acknowledgement statement. That is a statement that acknowledges that the University of Washington is built on land that one once belonged to some Indian, some Native American tribe, right? Um, you know, it's, it's meant to acknowledge this fact. Now, obviously, Professor Regis doesn't think very highly of these. He says, quote, land acknowledgments are performative arts of conformity that should be resisted. So last school year, instead of reprinting the university approved language, which is, quote, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shore wa shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Squamish, Tulip, and whatever nations, so that's it, that's the that's the acknowledgement. Just acknowledging that this is their land, or this was their land, is their land. <laughs> Regis constructed his own disclaimer, and he put up on top of his syllabus, he said, quote, I acknowledge that by the labor theory of property, this is uh, John Locke's theory of property, 
by the labor theory of property. The Coast Salish people can claim historical ownership of almost none of the land currently occupied by the University of Washington. And that appeared in his syllabus at the top page, at the top of the page. It's very educational. There's the whole issue of what is the, uh, you know, the uh, labor theory of uh, property. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the university was pissed off um, and they retaliated. Uh, they uh, unilaterally uploaded a, uh, a censored version of the syllabus, took off his statement without any acknowledgement, locked him out of being able to make any changes to his own syllabus so he couldn't access it. And then they launched an investigation of Regis, right? They also established a competing class section at the same hour as his class section in order to siphon students away from him. I, just <laughs> think about how petty and how childish these people are, right? They couldn't fire him because he's got tenure, so they do all this stuff. Right? Um, now, remember, the, the, the statement that they wanted placed there, they said, was a recommendation. What they didn't like was the fact that he made fun of it. Didn't make fun of it. Maybe told the truth about it. So we're just still teaching there, but he has now filed a lawsuit against uh, the University of Washington. Uh, it's a lawsuit filed by FIRE, so good for FIRE, uh, for launching this. FIRE protects the free speech rights of, uh, or academic uh, freedom rights of professors at universities. Uh, they, uh, they, tend to, uh, they tend to defend professors against university administrations. Uh, to quote uh, the writer that I'm uh, reading from her article that she wrote for Barry Weiss, she says the threats, the, this threat comes from both left and right, the threat to academic freedom. Two thirds of sanctions attempted from, left, from, um, uh, from the left of the present, uh, professor result in some form of sanction. 42% of attempts from the right of wherever the professor is politically um, result in sanction. Uh, they, typically, uh, they typically defend these, uh, they fight for them, and uh, they've done, they do amazing work uh, in the name of, uh, in the name of uh, free, spe free speech, uh, but primarily uh, academic freedom violating the contract that the schools, the universities have with these professors. Um, it, it really is, the situation in universities has gotten so much worse over the last two years. Professors are now expected to mouth opinions stamped with the approval of some bureaucrat in the administration. Um, it is a, uh, it is, uh, you know, the state of universities is truly horrific. Anyway, so what is it about this land acknowledgement, and, or, or, or maybe, I mean, the land acknowledgement is, is, is obviously ridiculous and, and silly. I mean, you could make fun of it in a variety of different ways. Somebody on the chat just did. I, you know, what did he say? You know, I think John said uh, he lives in a house that was, that was uh, taken from the, Coma uh, of land that was taken from the Comanches, who took it from another tribe, who took it from another tribe, who, you know, uh, defaced it by, by uh, you know, building something on Mother Nature uh, to begin with. So it really, the land belongs to Mother Nature and not to any of these tribes. But almost everybody thinks that these land acknowledgements are ridiculous. I mean, I read an article in The Atlantic from a leftist who says, look, land acknowledgements is just moral exhibitionism. Um, it's, just, it's just lip service. It means nothing. I mean, where are the reparations? Where is the giving the land back? Where is paying them money? Where is the recognition of the real suffering that is happening among Native Americans today? Where is the recognition of the fact that they are the poorest people in America today? Uh, they, their rates of alcoholism, their rates of suicide, rates of depression are higher on Indian reservations than in any other place in America. Instead of recognizing that, instead of working to fix that, instead of doing anything about it, people get up and they have these, they have these uh, uh, written statements in advance that somebody's written on. They, they might have worked 
five minutes to, to pronounce the name of the Indian tribes right, and then they do it, and that's it. And this does bring up, I think, an important issue, uh, an issue that I, I did a show on a few years back about the treatment of American Indians, about the treatment of Native Americans, which I think is horrific and a massive injustice in American history. Um, but it does bring up the question of, okay, what do you do about this injustice? And what was the injustice exactly? How do you describe the injustice? How do you define the injustice? Was the injustice the taking of the land? And what does it even mean to take land from no man's? Or what does it mean to take land for people who didn't recognize rights to land? And who exactly did he take the land from? I mean, I, I think, first of all, the idea that we in the 21st century should feel sorry and apologize or, or do anything about, and let's, let's say there were injustices. And there were injustices. There's no question there were injustices. There were treaties broken. There was brutal treatment. There was a, a horrific, horrific, uh, a, a horrific treatment of the, uh, of the Native Americans in the 19th century in America. There's no question about that. And it goes on to this day. To this day, uh, Native Americans in the, in the reservations are wards of the state, which is horrific, and we'll get to that in a minute. But there were massive injustices. Land was stolen. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, what was it? The Sioux uh, were given a piece of land, and then, and then uh, gold was discovered on that land. So they were taken to the most barren place on planet Earth and given a, given the piece of land there, and so that the miners could go and mine the gold uh, that was in the hills. Instead of you had a treaty giving them the land, why don't they benefit from the mining? Anyway, it's it's horrors happened. The question is, what do you do about it in the 21st century? Well, you don't apologize for it because you didn't do anything. Your ancestors, some of our ancestors weren't even on the continent back then. Certainly my ancestors were not. But even if they were, maybe they should have apologized. Maybe they should have paid something and paid in some way for the evils they committed. But you, today, it's the same thing about slavery. Slavery is a horrific evil. Jim Crow laws were horrific evils. But I didn't do them. I'm not a fault. Taking my money to compensate people who are also not the people who suffered under slavery, certainly, and most of them not even under Jim Crow laws, is just a massive injustice. So well, the first thing to do is recognize what actually happened. And what actually happened is a combination of uh, violence initiated by Native Americans against peaceful people and, and then losing a war. People lose wars all the time. Some real injustices where treaties were broken or where land was just taken or where People were just uh, annihilated when that was not what was really needed, what was not what was really necessary. And also recognize, as Ayn Rand did, also recognize the fact that in a clash, as Ayn Rand said, in a clash between a growing civilization between an advanced civilization and a more primitive civilization, the primitive civilization is going to lose in a variety of different ways. And then add to that the fact that particularly in the Pacific Northwest, let's say, 90% of the Native Americans who died in the Pacific Northwest didn't die because they were murdered, didn't die because their land was taken over by whites, they died of disease. Died of disease brought to them by Europeans, yes. But not on purpose. What kind of moral claim do you have that because you carried a disease that they not happen to be immune from and you infected them, 
you're morally responsible? That can't be right. Does that mean the Chinese are responsible for the Black Death in Europe? Because that Black Death came over to Europe from China? So you have to recognize all the different sources of what happened. Again, 80 to 90% of the Native Americans in the North Pacific Northwest died from diseases. And the same thing is true of COVID. Uh, you know, unless, uh, unless they did it on purpose, unless COVID was um, uh, military, you know, uh, militarized, and then it's hard to understand why the Chinese would do it to themselves because they're suffering in some respects more than we are from COVID. But um, yeah, you, you can't, if, if COVID was natural, let's assume COVID was natural for the purpose of this discussion. I'm not saying it was, let's just assume it. If COVID was natural, then you can't blame China for it. That's ridiculous. You can blame China for suppressing information. You can blame China for not cooperating. You can blame China for not doing what was necessary. But you can't blame China for the very fact that this naturally arose. So you have to recognize all these things. And, and if you really study history and you're really interested in what happened to, um, to the American Indians, to Native Americans, and why it was so devastating and what the, what the um, source of the American injustice towards them is, then that study of history is really useful because if you really study it, the source of the injustice, the source of the injustice is that American, uh, Native Americans were not treated as individuals. Now, part of it is their fault because they didn't take themselves to be individuals. They were members of tribes. But we, as the more civilized, we, as, as, the, as the more advanced culture, what we should have done is refuse to treat them as tribes and treat them as individuals and assign them property rights, not as a tribe, but as individuals. So in that sense, we should have been even more cultural col col <laughs> colonists, colonialists, uh, cultural colonialists. We should have imposed our culture of individualism, our culture of property rights on the Native Americans. We should have refused to accept that the tribal leader speaks for the tribe, that the tribal council owns all the property for the tribe. And we should have at least tried to assign property rights to individuals. To this day, the, uh, the uh, um, Native American reservations, there was no private property on these reservations. Nobody owns anything. The tribal government owns everything. It's, it's like, it's, it's a true statism, true socialism. Tribal, uh, you know, to this day, we don't treat individuals within the, these Indian nations as individuals. We treat them as collectives. We treat them as a group. And since they have no private, but, but even then, uh, you know, a lot of these tribes sit on mineral rights. Well, if they want to develop the mineral rights, individuals can't do it. The tribe has to decide. And the tribe can't decide by itself. It has to get permission from the government, from the U.S. government, the federal government. Said so doubly screwed. If you're an individual and you happen to sit on oil, you can't lease it out to Exxon or Chevron. Yet the tribe has to do it. And the tribe can't do it unless it gets permission from the Biden administration. Good luck with that. So we have taken these, you know, Native Americans. And to this day, to this day, they have no individual dignity, no property. Um, they, are, they receive welfare checks. If the sound is weird, it's because of the ether, it's because of the cloud, it's because of the internet, not because of anything on my end. Uh, 
We treat them as, uh, you know, we, we, they are the only, it's the one area in, in this country where you have full-blown socialism. And with full-blown socialism, what do you get? With full-blown socialism, you get alcoholism, you get depression, you get high suicide rates. Now, it's hard for America today to encourage anybody to be an individualist when we, the country of individualism, are turning our back to individualism and becoming a tribal collectivistic culture. So the real tragedy of, of, uh, of Native Americans is that their leadership failed them. But to some extent, at least in the 19th century, their leadership was ignorant, knew nothing. The real tragedy is that American leadership, that knew intellectual leadership, political leadership, that knew what was right, it betrayed the Native Americans. It betrayed them. It continues to betray them. The treatment of, American, of Native Americans today by the federal government is just horrific. Just horrific. And uh, the solution to it is to privatize, to privatize the reservations, to, to, to force them to divide the land up turn it into private property, get rid of the reservation as a reservation, make them full-fledged citizens of the United States, and give them the respect that private property, you know, treat them with respect by giving them the private property um, and, and treating them as full citizens. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen, partially because, unfortunately, this is where their own intellectuals and their own leaders betrayed them. This is not what the tribes want, because the tribal leaders have power today, have power which they wouldn't have if he took all their property and divided it up and gave it to individual individuals. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.